Welcome to the straight red card. Um, today we have a special guest. His name is Brian Shredder. Did I say that right, Brian? My, yes, you did. My, I did. Okay. I thought I did. I was like, I remember he told us how to pronounce his name many, many years ago. I think it was 10 years ago. You were on a show with us on um, big soccer. Isn't that crazy? That was 10 years ago. It's insane. Yeah. That's a, that's just insane. I feel so old. Um, Brian is a writer for ASN. You've also wrote, I believe, for The Athletic. Stop me if I say something wrong. The New York Times, Soccer America. You're pretty regular there. Um, used to do Yanks Abroad back in the day. And then. Yeah, that, that, that was way. That's where I you know, kind of first started, you know, around the around the 07 U20 World Cup. That's really when I started cool. reading you you know back yeah. then Makes sense. and yeah <laughs> and then it just sort of grew and like then you know when once brett and i were on big soccer we were just picking out our favorite writers to bring on you were one of them um and then i think you did uh, something else for tampa the tampa bay times right do you have a podcast as well or are you just on a lot of people's podcasts? no i just go a lot i mean i'm on a regular segment schedule I even have my own theme song on a uh, Sirius XM so that's uh, really yeah that's actually pretty cool you know and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty close to the Sirius guys um, okay. and that's that's a lot of fun is it like Brian shredder he's got the no it's, it's like it's, 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 it's like really exciting just thing like you know it's like for something you know especially when my segments are like 8 30 in the morning it's like it's no. like, it'll wake you it'll wake you up I just Holy. it was the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, soundtrack. <laughs> Sorry, I'll interrupt. record it next time. I'll yeah, send it to you guys. It's pretty. I no, I'd like to hear it because I have all kinds of ideas about a theme song for you and your show once you <laughs> get a podcast going. But uh, so here we are. Um, we're doing our. I mean, the last time you were on a show, obviously, Brian, we were with Big Soccer. We were a lot less gregarious than we are now. So. I'm glad you're here now because now we're just free to speak openly and we really don't care. Um, so here we are. We got through the window, right? Um, mm -hmm. We got four points. Was four points acceptable to you? Or I think most people think it is. is that would Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I think, you know, the players and fans and coaches all wanted to, I think, win in um, Jamaica. But yeah, I think if four points gets the job done, uh, keeps them on a good pace. The, you know, that January window is always going to be like the, the big, the most important part because that's, um, you know, that, that's the easier schedule. They got to rack up points for that and put themselves in a good position. But yeah, I mean, look, when you think about that, that was the toughest Jamaica is going to ever look um, because they had, they had Bailey and they had Antonio and um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and those two, I don't, I, I think that was a, I mean, did, when they, I know Antonio was only his third game and second start. And I don't know if they, Bailey and Antonio have ever played together on the national team. So it's like, you know, no one's so. ever going to, no one's ever going to face a Jamaica team that that's that, that's that good. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're playing on the road too, on top of it. Uh, you know, so <laughs> it, it's, it, you can't really compare like, like some random team drawing jamaica you know earlier in the earlier in the cycle or later cycle that was that was jamaica's um fastball that was their big one that was their that was their out pitch you know and um but didn't and, you think uh, we we kind of dropped off a little too though like there would seem to be a little lack of energy there i get it it's you know it's conca calf you're, you're going yeah abroad. it's conca calf you're playing you, you know you go from the highs of playing against mexico and ohio to like a mostly empty stadium in Kingston and, uh, and I get it too, but yeah, you know, look, you guys have been around long enough too. the, the road qualifiers are, they're, they're just different. They're not, they're, they're not an easy, they're not an easy thing. Um, and well, uh, that's and just we, what, that's what happens. We were, sometimes. we were missing sort of an essential piece too, though. And I think it became really evident that McKenney was. Yeah. He's, he's the guy. I think that when, when you need to win ugly games, um, you know, he's going to be in that ugly mix and, 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 uh, and be able to do it. And then all of a sudden when you take McKenny out and you put him in, you put in two teenagers who aren't like the most defensively astute players on the lineup too. Um, right. that leaves a lot of heavy lifting. And then when you, 
then when you kind of have to glue that midfield together with Tyler Adams, who is the most probably the most indispensable player on the national team, but who's yeah. let's face it is also not playing that well. The last really since that Dortmund game, mm-hmm. what was that six weeks ago, four, six, five, six weeks ago, besides mm-hmm. that game really hasn't had the best season. If we're being honest. Um, yeah, that's it's it's it's, it's it, you know, it, it's learning, you know, it's it, it it didn't really I can kind of see how it would put the U.S. team in a tough situation, too. It's 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 not it wasn't the best lineup. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of they're looking back on it. 2020 is hindsight, but you can kind of see where the weaknesses were. So I, yeah. I think I think one thing to consider when it comes to the amount of points from this window, I think a lot of I think a lot of people were going to this window. uh saying four points was their expectation. Uh, they would have been mm-hmm. happy with that. And then we come out of the Mexico game, you know, all guns guns blazing, just, you know, firing from the hip. Mm-hmm. Absolutely destroyed them. And then we went into Jamaica and put in a pretty lackluster performance at points, some decent play at points. And, but we came out with the tie still. We still got the four points. Um, I think there, there's a number of people that are just disappointed in the sense that We've lost for whatever reason. We go on the road and we we go on the road from playing really successful games at home, and then we play away, and it's just like we lose all momentum, we lose all interest, and it's just it's just it's just a bummer how it drops down. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I just and, consider me as just a different point of view, and the fact that like I've seen these kind of things before, and I've seen sure. very good Mexico teams struggle on the road too, and mm-hmm. you know. And even the U.S. team in their best days, you know, uh, with the national team did too. And now you're doing so with a talented generation, but still a very inexperienced generation too at that. And playing on the road is part of something I think that comes with experience at the best, at least being able to do so consistently. I mean, you you know, you could always have one-offs that are very, very good, but be able to consistently play on the road well on the road for World Cup qualifiers is is a very, it's a skill that I haven't, I've only rarely seen. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and they put themselves in a chance to, 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 to get the result that they wanted to win. Um, but you know, it's, uh, you're dealing also like, again, with a, with a Jamaican team that can, that can make things happen. Um, and that, un, you know, unfortunately I don't be, I, let's put it this way. I'll be surprised if Antonio and Bailey are regular attendees with Jamaica, um, in 2020, I think yeah, I, they, yeah, at least maybe, maybe, maybe more so Antonio. I think this was really his shot. And Jamaica, we complain about the the U.S. fans complain about the draw. Um, I think that 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 that's that's that was the death nail for Jamaica. Um, and uh, and it's too bad because when you fill out an A plus or the starting the best possible starting eleven for Jamaica, yeah, it's actually pretty good. It um, is, yeah. and and and. Uh, you know, they had some injuries and they just they they had some players not show up and they just didn't get it done. Um, you know, I think the three window the three game windows earlier hurt them when they had to rotate players. So um, you know, in the end of the day, uh, yeah, it is what it is. But I mean, I think it's a good learning. Le- I think this whole thing, this whole cycle so far, has been a good learning lesson for fans as much as players sometimes um, in terms of uh, winning on the road. Yeah, I mean, I get it. It's always been hard. Um, it's always been difficult and, you know, I mean, so the CONCACAF thing, it, it is real. Um, that shot by Antonio was a bomb. And then, you know, we really could have just lost that game altogether, actually, because I don't think that was a really a foul. Um, that I thought that, so. You um, did? I know you and Yeah, Brad. you know, I mean, look, I know Walker, I've, been walking, I've been watching Walker Zimmerman for years and like Walker Zimmerman doesn't get sky high in the air on a, on a set piece. <laughs> Like, I mean, he's going to jump and he's <laughs> one of the best players in the air. Like yeah. uh, th- there's something impeding him from getting old, getting, you know, from him not jumping. Let's put All it that right. way. I'll just, uh, you and Brett should get together on that one. Cause you both agree. We are together. Um, dumb out. <laughs> this, this, we is, are. this is team right on this side. You're team wrong. This is a show and I'm wrong and you guys are right. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Um, the bigger but, danger was on the one where, where, uh, Robinson uh Anthony it. Robinson blew the thing to, um, Blew, blew his coverage and, and, <laughs> and Reed just shot the ball. <laughs> Reed had a horrible well, game. But he didn't blow. He didn't blow the coverage. He he missed. He missed. Uh, I don't know if he tried to possess it or try to clear it or whatever. But he basically just tapped it, it to him on yeah. the six. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's what. Just, I, yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It was just here. Game winning goal. Take it, please. Oh, you fucked that one up, man. <laughs> and yeah, Cordova- and then and then obviously way way up blue by too. You know, on the goal, it was just the, that was just a tough game. <laughs> yeah, for him. Yeah, yeah, no, Reed. Yeah, that was a bad game for him. And then you know that's Robinson's teammate too. He passed. I know, it to his, and they're both his, having great years. Everyone, on Fulham I know, right Fulham yeah. is killing it right now, and they're almost surefire going to be back up in the Premier League next season. I have to ask you this though, Brian, and I know because I think you have been on some of the um, Greg Berhalter you know, post and pregame. Oh, yeah, I'm on all of them, yeah. That's what I thought. Because, I, I, you know, you can't hear it sometimes. It's like, shmurmur, shmurmur, from shmimmy, shmimmur. You know, and you're like, I don't know who's asking this question. The question's like, murmur, 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 murmur. And then, you know, Greg answers it, and you can only guess what the question was. But um, we did have, um, well, Meg, who's, you probably know, Meg Swanick, um, I mean, she came out many, many months ago and was like, yeah, there's a kind of a rift growing between Brooks and Greg. I mean, I can't say it for 100 percent, but, you know, she was there on the ground with the team, traveling with the team, and she sort of sensed something wasn't going right. Um, what do you make of the whole not calling up Brooks yet calling up McKenzie from Gank, who doesn't even play? I mean, I mean, is is Brooks on the outs here going forward? No, you know, I, I, I've been following. I think I was like the first player to ever, first person to ever interview Brooks as a player. And back when he was in his first U20 camp, I think, under Thomas Rangan. And, you know, and, um, you know, and Brooks has had, I think, runs in, run ins with just about every single one of his coaches at some point or another. Yeah. Um, club or country. I mean, Klinsman was the same way, um, yep. you know, uh, arena. He was very, he was only with, I think one game before he got suffered that injury. Um, mm-hmm. second time. And then, and then, and then clubs times so he gets benched and, um, you know, you've, he's been, if you go back, all you have to do is Google and you'll find every coach calling him out at one point or another, you know, <laughs> yeah. and Brooks does dumb things. I mean, like, I mean, one time in his career, he had to miss Bundesliga games, big Bundesliga games at the end of the season because he got a back tattoo and he was too sore to play. Um, uh, remember that? Like, yeah, it was, yeah. you know, I, I mean, about it until you just brought back up. Yeah, yeah, I know. Was... These kind of things, unfortunately, happen. I, I personally think Brooks is a guy who every now and then just needs to get his ass kicked by his coach, you know, and then, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 um, and then you, and then, and then eventually he he always seems to kind of right the ship and play better. He's a very talented guy, but if you look at his career arc, it's never consistently at that high arc that you know he can play at, right? It's it's there's there's always you know sl- uh, slumps and ruts and and then and then you find out that there's the you know there's you know there's some people the coaches call him out and something. Brooks doesn't get along with the coach, and then eventually things get right. So if there is a rift with Berhalter, and I'm not saying that there is, um, you know, it doesn't really strike me as anything out of the ordinary for Brooks on anywhere he is in his career. And look, um, if he needed a wake-up call, if that's just typically what he gets in his throughout his career to start playing better um, – Maybe it's going to work out. I mean, look, central defense was fine this window. Um, I think Brooks will be back with the team, but maybe he just, you know, needed one of these wake up calls and, and 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 a little bit of a criticism here and there. Well, I think but, the I think the uh, way that Zimmerman and Miles are playing, and then including Richards, who's had a pretty decent uh, outing for uh, the U.S. national team so far. Uh, I don't think they're in contention as far as the concern. I think the concern would be the fourth center back position, which was McKenzie in the situation. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it doesn't always have to be McKenzie either. You know, it's like, um, you know, there's, there's other guys popping up and, you know, we'll see what happens when long gets better or if Reem ever comes back Is you know, Reem has been playing great this season. You know, yeah. it's just, I mean, is he, is he going to be the guy that, Want there at the World Cup? No, but no. is he a guy who can fill in with Concacaf and bring like professionalism to a squad? I've always understood why Reem's been called up for the. If you have a young squad, why not bring in a guy who's like 
the mold. Not it's not like you're just bringing him along for the ride because he has been because he is doing things well at the professional at the at the club level. But he's also, I mean, he's he's like the model professional. Um, yeah, there's a reason why he's a captain. He's he's one of the best. If you just look at championship performances, not defender, you know, champ players in the championship, then they go on and move to bigger leagues. Just championship performance. He's one of the best players of this generation in terms of central defenders. Any nationality, like right. I mean, he's he's he- he's heading towards his third or fourth promotion. He's team captain. Of these go. He's a great championship player. But so anyway, you know, there's there's there are other options out there to get the job done. I understood McKenzie was just a guy. I, I think he was brought in as the fourth center back and. And he's kind of, you know, why I think the reason why they went with him is that if you, you know, might as well have a fourth center back who, who's at least kind of, you know, been going through the motions a little bit this year. Yeah. What about, you know, and this is just, I'm just throwing this out there. I mean, I understand Scottish League is not all what everybody thinks it is. Oh, Vickers. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron Carter Vickers has been playing, even scoring on occasion for Celtic, and he's playing for Celtic. It's not like he's playing for Aberdeen or, yeah. you know, yeah, St. Mirren. Or... Well, you was yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 all, a lot of the Americans in Scotland have been doing well this year. Um, it's actually been pretty interesting to see. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, you I know, think you mentioned be... one of them. Um, um, Harks, oh, yeah, Harks Dundee United. Some, I mean, yeah, I like him. Like, I think he's a good player. Like, um, uh, whether or not he rises to the level of the national team. You know, I think that's what a lot of your your listeners probably care about. I I don't know, but yeah. he's a very useful player for for clubs. Like he's you know he's now he's kind of going to Scotland that's helping pick up some grit to his game, which I don't. You know, I think he was a little soft at DC United, a little skinny. Now, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now he's like you know he, he's kind of he's learned how to play with the roughness too while keeping the quality. I I think yeah, I I hope he makes him. Um, I, I I he's one of those players that you know it'd be really. Like Luca De La Torre, it'd be really unfortunate if he's with the same club next year. Like, um, you know, it, it's time for him to kind of you know, either go his... to the old firm or go to another league. Or, yeah, um, I mean, he's... heck, even come back to you know, be a, yeah, be a big, big a, be, take a bigger role here. But I don't think he's going to get the money here. Yeah, that he would, you know, over there just because he's he was waived by DC United. So I don't know. Um, Anyway, but with it's Vickers, a little surprising, though, yeah, was that? It was a little surprising to see him being waived, and then how well it was. He, he's performed in Scotland. Yeah, I mean, look, he had to go to Dundee United when they were in second, tier. second division. When, yeah, but you know, look, but what happened? He got them to promotion, and he was named on the second tier team of the season for the league. So yeah. it was quickly obviously that you know he outgrown the league. Then there was one year of adjustment. Now all of a sudden he's here. And I and and if the season were to end today, which it won't, like he's on pace to be at least uh, team of the season in the Premiership. That's 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 really a nice story. Um, and then the next jump for him would be maybe a championship team in England. Yeah, I you think um, you know uh, you know it depends on you know obviously you know pay. He's now he's twenty six, so you know he's got to kind of chase the money too. Um, right. You know, it's not one of those things where. You, you, you know, when you're very young, maybe you don't take the most financially lucrative deal because, you know, in your prime years, you'll be able to make it up. It's like he's at a, you know, he's at an age where he needs to chase the money, which is why I'm surprised Chris Mueller is going to Scotland because I'm convinced he's taking a pay cut versus what Orlando's last offer must have been. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. and now you know, he's not even going to old firm, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, 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 it's like I think he's he's doing what Perry Kitchen did in terms of like like money he might not see again unless like the the stars align. So you yeah. know, you wish them the best, but it's like wow, that's a that's a gutsy decision. I don't know if I would make at this stage of my career. I'd chase the money. And what's your what's your view on CCV before we leave Scotland? Yeah, I, I think you know, I, look, I still think he's he's going to fall beyond. I mean, the level of play he hasn't really stood out. I think in the European games he's gotten. And so I think, you know, you're playing against the St. John Stones of the world and, and then every now and then against the Rangers. Is it really going to do enough to put you against the guys already in camp or then even guys who are also struggling to get into camp? Like Matt Miazga, a couple starts here and there. Yeah. You know, you, know, you fall behind him. And, you know, I, I'm still a believer that eventually um, 
Palmer Brown's going to break in the Chois starting lineup. So, you know, you put him in there with like those, with the guy like Palmer Brown and others and, you know, and maybe, it, maybe it works out, but, and, and you keep monitoring them, but, you know, right now you're talking seventh, eight, seventh, probably at best seventh on the depth chart for him. I and, know. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I think honestly he would have been best served finding a way to go back to uh, Bournemouth and being part of a real promotional effort, like a chance for the automatic promotion as opposed to, um, you know, you're, Celtic, but that's just my own opinion. You're probably right, but Celtic offered a lot more money. And so, I mean, again, I mean, that's one of those. Yeah, but decisions. I think Bournemouth is going to go up. I really. Oh, no, you're right. Good. They probably are going to go up. but And that's so that, money too, so. That might have been a better decision, but that's kind of hard to predict, whereas the Celtic money is kind of like guaranteed every year because you know yeah. you're going to be one or two in, in Scotland. So, I mean, the Bournemouth thing is like, you have to have that. But, you know, feeling. you know, when you play with Celtic, OK, as a central defender, it's a different game than it is anywhere else, because Celtic and Rangers, unless they're playing each other, they're they're They are so far advanced up to the field and because they, they, they have so much. The talent gap is so much more that you're going to the central defenders are going to be able to move inside the attacking half a lot more. Um, they're going to have a lot more time to patent to make the passes that they do in this time and space and advancement just usually isn't there on the international game particularly on the road so look i also think he's good on those gritty games too when when you have to just like clear and and and, and gut your way out to win but it's 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 either like he's on a relegation theme or, or or a flat out promotion contending team it's like it's 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 tough but celtic is a far different game as a central defender than than, than a lot of other places just because of that talent gap in the, in the league. Yeah, for sure. Um, Brett, I think we had some actual we, – we sent out a message earlier to uh, people letting you know you were going to be on the show, and uh, they were going to share some questions. Can we get that up on the screen so we can ask – I mean, I have a bunch of my own questions, yeah. but I figured we would indulge them well, with some of their questions too. But Yeah, I'll let, I wanted to uh, – let's go ahead and bring up – Yes, yeah, I'll let you first. do that. The other thing, though, while Brett's doing that, is we're bringing back VAR. We're bringing back the VAR, Brian. I mean, is that going to really change anything, or is it going to make it worse? I think uh, I'm I'm a supporter of VAR. And, I am too. And, and you know, look, it's it's never it's never foolproof. You complain about things, but things that are done in the best effort to 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 get calls right. And anytime you can kind of sniff out like the egregious mistakes, I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and before we even get to the question, fan questions, I did want to bring up Revelations Cup because you covered that pretty extensively. We got uh, Mikey Varas coaching. He's a FC Dallas uh, um, assistant coach. Now he is the U20 coach. I mean, what did you get out of that U20 tournament? I mean, what players? I mean, it was it was just, you know what? What it was is more than anything on the field, it built up some good vibes for the program. Um, the players got to see each other, spend time with each other, kick the ball around, notice some things from strengths. Now, obviously, the team was put at a massive disadvantage. To but they got better after that Brazil, that tough Brazil game. But um, you know, I think it was just good to have the program back. You need to have these kind of camps mm-hmm. because uh, you know the player; these players haven't played to get played with each other like ever. You know and not even at younger age groups because that age gap has been, you know, the, we've lost so much time with um, due to COVID with the youth, the top youth programs being shut, being shut down. I think it's a, it's a very good uh, age group uh, for the U S the O threes and the O fours. And uh, I think, it, you know, if they can get the team together enough times and, 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 um, and Varus who talking to players and, other people in and around the team, they really like them. You know, I think it's it's going to be good to have that kind of um, of an environment in camp, uh, and uh, and I think there's a real good chance uh, you, you that he's going to be able to put together a good team next summer that will attempt to qualify for both uh, the U20 World Cup and the Olympics. And and look, I think it's just good news that that Olympic qualifying is is out of the U23s and is now falling to the U20, at least qualifications going to the U20 level because 
the U.S. has been much better at the U20 level. Um, you know, it's it, it's not even close. It's a good can team, I, though. There's a lot of good maybe, players I like. Can I ask you this? Because, you know, I just did a little show about all the, the U20s in Europe, like the top 32 of them. There weren't a lot of European kids on there playing in Germany or Italy yeah. or, I mean, what? I mean, was it because clubs didn't want to release them for the revelation? Well, I, I think right now, if you were to do the top USU 20 team, um, you know, you're going to find almost all of them or a huge chunk of them are in MLS right now. And it's just because the over, you know, remember the last U 20 cycle was scrapped. Uh, so it's been a while, but like the dynamic has changed. Like, you know, a lot of the younger players have signed with MLS teams and they're more willing to do so because MLS has become a, a good place to get minutes and be a good place to get sold. It's just, you're starting to see a lot of the league's teams selling and developing and giving money. It MLS has become a more of a young person's league. So they've been able to entice their homegrowns to sign deals um, with the first team. And it makes sense. I mean, look, you go, if you just, just kind of go through the biggest names on the team, you know, Ricardo Pepe probably won't be with this team ever, but, you know, he's still the best. He's still in the age group. So you have Pepe, Cal, Brady's, Caden Clark, Paxton Aronson. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, Justin Che and, and, and obviously Gaga Slanina. Like, it's it's just, a, it's domestic. And then the, the, the more young players are willing to start in MLS and come through MLS academies. Then they were, and now, as opposed to going over the, to Europe just to, at the academy level, which is very tough and cutthroat, and you know you're start you're starting to see the success stories of direct moves to Europe before playing any kind of domestic soccer. Um, it's it's definitely on the decline more. You know, I so, mean, you see a lot of cautionary tales like you know Sebastian Soto and Uli Lan. Oh yeah, yeah, for and, sure, yeah, and Kobe <laughs> Hernandez Foster and. You know, and Brian Kao and, and a lot Brian of these Kale, players. I like yeah. almost feel like some of those are more just personality and uh, um, attitude problems. More, But so that's part it. of it, though. Yeah. You know, like going over there is, a, is an emotional test as much as a soccer sure. test. And, um, and you know, it's, it's kind of one of the things where you play here, you play close to home, you play in coaches that believe in you, you get over there. But then when you get sold and teams pay transfer fees for you, they pay transfer fees for you, you're almost always going to get a shot at the um at the at the first team level when you go over there and and so that's so now all of a sudden when you're looking at the O3s you know that's the oldest that's the older age group the between the O3s and the O4s that'll make up the U20 team you're 18 years old it's it's tough to you know legally just to make a move at that age so mm -hmm. at this age you know you're kind of you're you're almost certainly going to see um uh you know a, a almost heavily domestic um uh base roster I get it, but here, let me throw some names at you, and you tell me if I'm wrong, okay? John Tompkinson, 19-year-old, Norwich U23s, plays every game. Why is he not on that club? Uh, what, why isn't he, he an O2? Isn't Tom, isn't he an O2? Uh, he's 19, so... He's, Which would make him out. He's if he's 19, he's that would mean he would have to be an O2. I don't, you know, correct so my too, math. He's too old? Okay. Yeah, you have to well, be 03s and 04s, yeah. and then anything younger than that, you're going into the, the following U20 cycle. Fuck, I must not understand U20 anymore and what that means. <laughs> so, that, out of curiosity, though, they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily be calling people up who wouldn't be qualified to play in the U20 World Cup, even though they are test, technically U20s now. So, yeah, you know, you're, you're not, 19, yeah, yeah, you're not going to call up a 19 year old. Why would you call up qualified? someone yeah. who's like, it's like calling up Buzio or Testman? It's like, you know, it's like, or, this, you know, well, what about Tessman 19 too? What? what about what about Dante Seeley? Well, he's an 03. So he's too old. Well, no, fuck. he's he's fine. He could be oh, 2003 birth year and 2004 birth year make up this U20 cycle. 04s and 01 uh, oh, oh sorry. Uh oh, twos and 01s are are too old. Well, so my question is why wouldn't Dante Seeley be called up for this Revelations Cup? I I just He was. was. I I I, I Oh yeah, you're right. Up. He was. Oh, I'm an idiot. You're right. <laughs> no, I, I I did two interviews when I was with the team. Down, when I not with the team, but with uh, speaking to the team in Mexico from my confines in New Jersey, I, I spoke to Malik Sonogo and uh, Dante Celia and then Paxton Aronson just before he left. 
Okay, yeah. So I'm an idiot. I forgot he was on the team. So I'm sorry. This happens. I'm old. I'm 50. I'm dumb. Um, what about like somebody like Evan Rotunda? Yeah, South? I mean, he's. I, I think he's he's going to be in the mix at some point too. Um, I mean, he's very young. He had, a, he had the European passport. That's what led allowed him to go over there too. But you know, I mean, he's he, he's crushing it at the Schalke youth level. Um, but you know. It, Crushing it at these youth levels yeah, in, in Germany. Yeah, U nineteen Bundesliga, U nine U seventeen Bundesliga really doesn't always. Tr- I one time did a project once where I looked at all the top scores, and you remember there's four U seventeen Bundesligas, four U nineteen Bundesligas because it's regionalized. It's not one national league at that point. And I was right. looking at like the top ten leading scores in each of the those Bundesligas and um, at the youth at the U nineteen level over a 10 year span like so like the top five or ten s- scores in 10 years or so like hundreds of players and you'll be surprised like i mean a vast majority of them are are out of the game or play in the regional league when they get to be you know when they age out of youth soccer yeah um it does you know it, it's 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 very much a you find like after looking at all these players i found like 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 two or three percent were ever of the leading scores were like good enough for like the U S national team, if they were American, you know? So it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's very much a, you know, back when Thomas Rongen was the U 20 coach, they used to have camps like every month and he would call in like a hundred players a cycle and really get a look at it. But with this U S U 20 team, you have a camp in January. You had this camp in January, the, they march and that's essentially it. Yeah. So uh, they might have one pre-camp or I don't know if they're planning on having a February camp or not, but like you're only dealing with a couple of uh, real shots at this kind of thing too. So it's, it's tough for them. Yeah. I mean, Rona has certainly affected, um, especially when I look at players in Europe, almost all their seasons were like mostly yeah. canceled. Like all these young players where you're talking about Avre at Lil or, you know, uh, Jaheim Headley at Huddersfield or even uh, Matt Rattaccio at, uh, I might be saying that wrong, at, at Liverpool. They just didn't get any games. They didn't get any games. So we, we had like almost a one and a half year suspension right, of you know, growth and, it's, and, it's and tough. development. And I, and I think that with this team, this U20 team, is that the attack is going to be probably be okay. Um, uh, you know, they could probably figure out, you know, if Sano goes the guy or not, he scored a lot at the youth levels. It remains to be seen. That's a good thing. I'm not dismissing being a good score at these U- U19 or U17 Bundesligas. Right. But, you know, at, at some, but it doesn't really guarantee, I think, translate to the way some people think or hope or expect. So, you know, I, but I think, you know, in the end of the day, you get, you're, you know, Cal Paredes, you know, and these guys are all going to be good. They are, Quinn Sullivan is going to be good. You know, they, they, they have – the attack is good. I just think that, you know, their, their defensive midfield and central defense and are, are going to be big question marks for the team. So, um, yeah. we'll see. You know, it's, it, it, it's certainly a team that I think, uh, you know, with some polishing should be able to get the job done. At least, you know, they have a lot of, a lot of experienced pros – very early in the cycle, uh, which is rare for a USU 20 level. I mean, I you, guess already have, you have guys with thousands of minutes, uh, first team minutes, which is, um, you know, at I mean, the start of a cycle, which is great. It's, it's a great improvement for MLS. I guess all I'm saying is don't forget about the kids in Europe. Too. No, it's, yeah, it's just the, diff- the dynamic has changed though. It's, it's just, there's just not that many just leaving, going to the Academy levels in Europe. Um, that at least not including the dual nationals who were born and raised in Europe. That's, Already there. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's like, there's your, a lot like of your, them. Yeah. Like your Serginio desk type guys, like, like moving for, from Serginio desk to move to Ajax is like moving down the street. You know, it's like, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's just a different beast. Um, you don't see as much of that, I think, which is fine, but like, yeah, I mean, yeah, look, they did call up Sealy in this camp and they did call up Sonogo in this camp and, and you'll see what happens again in, um, in uh in january yeah i mean i guess my only point was there are a lot of kids over there i know they're at kaiser slotten and Mainz, and you got nicholas dossman i mean there are a lot of guys 
on the fringes. Oh, there's always a lot of guys. I think, yeah, um, a lot and of them. And they are getting scouted. I, you know, it's again, it's it's they're gonna they're gonna shoot with limited roster spots and limited camps. I think it's gonna be, uh, you know, guys that they feel good about. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I don't think it's gonna be aimless, you know, aimless kind of call ups. Um, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a little more focused than that. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but you know, yeah, I don't think these guys are being ignored at all. I think you're right. I no, think- I mean, you know, it's just you gotta you gotta play well. It's not just you know, it, it's um, I mean, if you if you play well, I, I'm kind of convinced you're gonna get noticed. Yeah, I mean, we got a couple guys at Gladbach too right now, Soros and Wenzel, and they're not playing that well. And so that's why they're not. Well, Wenzel's, Wenzel's, Wenzel's not knocking, on the, do- bad. knocking yeah. on the door, but, you know, I think, um, but again, I think he's, I don't think he's U20 eligible. So. He's no, and he's no Joe Scally. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs>